This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know, here again, still in Corona Land 2020. Those listening in real time, right at the end of March, beginning of April. And, of course, coming up on Passover, and just a very, very bizarre confluence of unprecedented experiences for all of us with the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic and the onset of Passover in a matter of days. I think this week's guest is really appropriate. Rabbi Dr. Sharon Shalom is an incredible person, one of the leaders of Ethiopian Jewry in Israel, a brilliant person who has made an incredible life for himself in the Holy Land. And his personal journey, as he himself will describe, is really an embodiment of the saga of the Jewish people and mass. His own sojourn from Ethiopia to Sudan, ultimately to Israel, and then his renaissance in that place, in many ways mirrors the exodus and the flowering of the Jewish people that we celebrate and relive every year on Pesach, Passover. So I'm excited to present him today and specifically during this time of difficulty the world over and in proximity to the upcoming holiday. A reminder again, this is perhaps your last chance before Passover and may not even be guaranteed delivery at this point, but it still could arrive in time if you act quick. Kosherwine.com slash Jews you should know. Kosherwine.com slash Jews you should know. Receive a $25 wine voucher off your first order. A reminder, of course, as always, to subscribe, whether on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you may be listening. Please share with others as well so that they may likewise do so. Submit any comments or suggestions at JewsYouShouldKnow at gmail.com. Follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram, JewsYouShouldKnow spelled out fully, and JewsYouShouldKnow with the letter U on Twitter. And now to our riveting conversation with Ethiopian Jew, Rabbi, philosopher, Rabbi Dr. Sharon Shalom. We are here with Sharon Shalom, a leader of the Ethiopian Jewry movement in Israel, a person with a fascinating life story, and very, very excited to speak with Sharon. We've been working for months to try to connect. So, how are you, Rabbi? Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Um, finally, finally, Rabbi Ari. I'm very, very happy to hear from you because uh, you never give up, you give up, you know, like Avram Avinu, go, go, keep going and never stop, <laughs> you never give up. And, uh, you know, kol od baleva nima nefesh yudi omia, od lo avda tikvateinu, as this has happened, Baruch Hashem. So I'm very, very happy to speak with you. You know, coronavirus uh, period of time, we are in the jail now, but as a Jewish people, we are free. <laughs> That's right. Well, I figured this is a good time to, to have an interview. And um, persistence is the name of the game in this podcast business. So, Sharon, tell us a little bit about where you're from. Obviously, Ethiopia, but give us some of the background and the context for your early life. This is amazing. It's an amazing uh, story. My story is not only my personal story. My story represents the Jewish history. Okay, you know, someone named is George Friedman, he wrote that the history of Jewish people is accident of history. He wrote to national historia. This is accident of history, you know. When Mark Twain, Mark Twain wrote that all the uh, national, like uh, Greek, like uh, Egypt, they lost and they disappear, but Jewish nation still survive and remain. 
and he asked, what is the secret of his immortality? So when I speak with you now, it's not only, you know, the miracle, the miracle is not because now we speak uh, by Zoom or I don't know why, okay, this is, this is this miracle, okay, you, you are now in the States and now I'm in Israel, in Jerusalem, it is a miracle, but it's more miracle is that two Jewish people, uh, Rabbi Arik and Sharon here in Israel, and I, I do not exaggerate, but we are two brothers, two brothers that we were separated during 2000 years of exile. And Baruch Hashem, now we're speaking in each other's. Okay, so this is Ethiopian Jewish story. It's amazing, amazing story. You know, I remember when you live in, uh, in Maryland. So I, my first time when I, I visit in Washington and I took a taxi and the taxi driver, he was uh, African American. He saw me with my keeper and he asked me because he was in shock. And he say, and he asked me, my brother, uh, where are you from? And I answered, I'm from Israel. And he told me, oh, really? There is a, a, a black people? There is black people in Israel? And I answer, I'm not black, I'm brown. And he continued to scream, say, oh, my goodness, I hear about you. You are Ethiopian. You are Falasha, Falasha. And now, I, as I understood that a lot of African American, they used to fall in after Ethiopian Jews here, how we integrate us, uh, you know, black uh, people from Africa to, you know, white uh, society or both also Jewish society. So they very interested how Ethiopian Jews, they involved in integrate to Israeli uh, society. So they know everything about what happened with the Ethiopian Jewish community here and say, oh, I hear about you, you are Falasha. And actually, Falasha is mean stranger in uh, coding Giz language. Giz language is very, very ancient language. And this very similar to the Hebrew ancient, uh, ancient Hebrew, oh yeah? Uh, Falasha is mean stranger. So the Christians in Ethiopia, they call us Falasha, it means you are stranger. And I remember when I grand, my grandpa, he used to sit with, uh, with us under, uh, in, in our village, and he opened the Bible, and he used to read the, in the, in the Ishayahu, Anabi Ishayahu, in Anabi Yirmiyahu, in Anabi Yechezkel, how the prophets, they promise that in one day, God will, in gathering his people from all the world, bring them to Jerusalem. And וזה פסוקים, you know, it's amazing. And I used to ask my grandpa, אוי, grandpa, grandpa, please, when God going to, um, in full, I would say, uh, full full, excuse me, fulfilling this, 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 his promise by, by, by uh, his uh, prophets, when is going to happen? And my grandpa, he used to answer like this, now. Now, it's going to be now. And say, yes, no. And when I grew up, I understood that also his grandpa promised to him now. When I grow up more, I understood that each generation promised to the next generation now, 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 during 2,000 years of exile. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, I used to say that Therefore, if Ethiopian origin, origin 
he telling you now, uh, please don't believe him. And secondly, we don't need to believe to big uh, philosopher, name is uh, uh, Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche told us that a uh, hope is an illusion. Hope is an illusion. So hope is not an illusion. Hope is reality. Because, you know, Ethiopian Jews, they promise now, 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 for their generation, during 2000 years of, of exile, and this dream, and this dream, kol od balevav pnima, nefesh yehudi homia, all of that tikvateinu, and this finally, finally happened, and it's reality. This is a miracle, miracle. John, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Were you in Adi Ababa's? Where, where did you grow up? I was born in a little, in a little village. In, this is in a, in, in a Tigray area, Tigray area. And uh, in, actually, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we grew up with a story, a lot of story about uh, Jerusalem. And uh, I remember when my grandpa, he, telling, he told us about Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem is a city of gold, and everything is gold. And have a tap water in the wall, and you open it and throw out no water, throw out milk. You know, milk, like Erez, Zabat, Chalau, Dvash. And he used to tell us that all the people, they, they are Jewish, and no one call you Falasha. It means no one call you stranger, because you will going to be there, one of the uh, Jewish people, and because you're going to be in your home, in your house, in Jerusalem. So when in 1973, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, he decided to recognize Ethiopian group as a Jew. Actually, Ethiopian Jews, they were all the time Jewish, okay? You know, in uh, just, um, I don't know if you know, Rabbi, uh, because in, in 60th century, Radbad, Rabbi David Ben Zimra, is a very, very famous rabbi in Egypt. He uh, recognized Ethiopian Jews as a Jew. And he say, Ethiopian Jews, they are descendants of Dan, Shevet Dan, okay? And according to this Psika, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef in 1973, he decided to recognize Ethiopian Jews as a Jew. Therefore, in, in 1975, a Knesset member decided they receive a decision which say Ethiopian Jews, they can move from Ethiopia to Eretz Israel according law of return. So when we got a message that uh, please leave your village and uh, go to Sudan and, you know, Sudan and from Sudan to uh, Eretz Israel, to Jerusalem. But uh, I want to tell you that Ethiopian Jews, you know, all the time speaking, I, I remember, I remember I visit in a very amazing community in the States. And the rabbi there, he introduced me and he read something from the newspaper, uh, which um, was uh, writing immediately after uh, Operation uh, Solomon. And they wrote that this is the first time that in the history that white people landed in Africa to take the black Jews to freedom, not to slavery. You know, I, and I asked myself, I never, I never uh, was uh, uh, slavery. I was a free, freedom. You know, the single community in Jewish world since Second Temple destruction, the Ethiopian community was that they established kingdom in Ethiopia. And they were autonomic authority. The Ethiopian Jews were the single Jews in the world they, they, that they established a kingdom and, and country in Ethiopia. 
So we never were, you know, the Ethiopian country in general, the white people, they never control colonialism. They never control Ethiopian, Ethiopian country, never. Because I never was, I, I was a free. So why, you know, in our consciousness, the consciousness is that white people, Israeli army, they went to Africa and they did something very hero and they brought uh, Ethiopian black Jews or Ethiopian Jews. No, no. They just help us to come to Israel. Okay, but the in initiative, the Yozma, the in in empire, the hero, the Akoah was from Ethiopian Jews that we decided to left everything and uh, to leave everything and go out to the journey. So you went to the Sudan to meet the Israelis. What was the actual journey like? You know, uh, as I mentioned before, we left our village. Actually, we were, uh, you know, in, in good life there. Okay, some people, they think that we, in Ethiopia, you know, Someone, he told me, listen, you know, I, I want to, I, I can't tell you why you left Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia and, we, and you moved to Israel because in Ethiopia, there is no food. There is no food. And he told me, you know, I can't uh, I can, uh, tell you joke that three boys, one of them is American and the other is Israeli and the third is Ethiopian and they sit together in the restaurant to eat something. And uh, after... Uh, 45 minutes, someone told them, sorry, we don't have any food. And the Israeli one stand very angry and he asked, what's the sorry? What's the sorry? And the Amer American guy, I asked in shock, what's this we don't have? What is we don't have? And the Ethiopian stand in shock and he asked, what's this food? What's this food? So, you know, <laughs> of course, in Ethiopia, <laughs> in Ethiopia, there is no food. But this is a preconception. This, uh, you know, but we, are, we were actually, uh, you know, the, st the style or standard of Ethiopian society, we were very rich. So we left everything. We By the way, Sharon, when I was growing up, it was the, uh, if you didn't eat all the food on your plate, they would say, there are starving children in Ethiopia who would love that food. <laughs> this was like the, the line. <laughs> Growing up, you yeah. know, it was a real stereotype. Yeah, of course. I, <laughs> thank you. I, I agree with you. So we, we, we went to the journey, and the journey took two months and a half. Two months and a half. And we lost a lot of people in the way. A lot of people. Bad time. Bad time. I remember that we arrived to, the, to one place which there is no food. Actually, this is, a, no, this is no joke. <laughs> this really, there is no food. There is no water. And people, they drink, um, you know, they eat no food, something, how do you say, alim, alim in Hebrew. Leaves. Uh, they, they, they drink their pishen, you know. The life was very, very, you know, the, this uh, moment was very, very hard. And uh, as I, I mentioned, we lost a lot of people, you know. Uh, in general, at the journey, Ethiopian Jews, about 4,000 people died in the way. 4,000 people. And we, Baruch Hashem, we never give up, we never stop. We arrived to Sudan country, okay? And there we were sure that after one week, a couple days later, we will be in Jerusalem. But unfortunately, this took a lot of time, uh, one week. To, uh, one year, until seven years, people stay in Sudan. Why couldn't they go directly from Ethiopia? Oh, Rabbi, you, are, uh, you have a Yiddish, how do you say in Yiddish? A Yiddish cop. A Yiddish cop. This is a good question because until today, uh, have uh, you know, a lot of questions. Why Mossad, they did not do it straight from Ethiopia? Why? they told to people, uh, they choose this option and no the other option to do the operation straight from Ethiopia. So this is a good question, but uh, as I, uh, I understood from the people, from the uh, Mossad service, 
they told us that is for them was more easy to do the operation from Sudan uh, more than the straight from uh, Ethiopia in a lot of virus of consideration okay so also you know who is open th- this this option is Ethiopian one uh, I don't know if you hear someone have in Ethiopian Jews couple of hero people okay name is Fred Aklum Fred Aklum was one of the Ethiopian Jews uh, which he opened the path or the, the way the Aliyah through Sudan country so this initiative is not was it did not come from uh, Mossad it's come from uh, Ethiopian Jews uh, themselves from Ferede okay but this is still in in Mossad they ask this question until today okay because they know now they pay a high price and we lost 4,000 if Mossad if they knew if they was no you know a priori that Ethiopian Jews they going to lost 4,000 people I think that maybe they was how do you say I think they they choose the one the first the first uh, option to do the operation state from Ethiopia and no through uh, Sudan anyway we arrive and most of the people died in Sudan no in the way from Ethiopia to Sudan is that by foot from Ethiopia to uh, Sudan is uh, by foot okay and uh, like Egypt like it at me time I much like it at me time with the mata with the mine with kemah with donkey hamorim susim mamash mamash it at me time okay but when we wait waiting in the waiting in Sudan in camp a refugee camp and uh, this is was a trouble this was a very very danger time in in this uh, period of time in Sudan I remember when my grand uh, my mom my mom she told me though the is Ethiopian my Ethiopian name she told me listen next day at the night you going to Jerusalem but we stay here in Sudan because we can't uh, go with you and now I know that my mother she want to save my life okay now like a lot of parents from the Holocaust first of all they send the, the children in order to save their life so this was also the consideration of my my mom in order to save my life she send me first to Jerusalem so uh, next day at the night I remember two guys from the they were uh, white people uh, Mossad they came they came to us and it's like the movie you know like the movie a darkness uh, we continue with a couple of uh, people and you see nothing and suddenly I saw two trucks two trucks and they told us uh, go up and we go up to the truck I remember I went first and I uh, sit down I sit down in the corner of the truck and now in two minutes or three I don't know maybe five minutes maybe ten minutes we were how many people in one small truck 150 people 150 people and no one complain no one complain silence in the Mossad was they were in shock in shock because even the babies no cry no one cry silence called the mama daka like mama dar sinai no one you know uh, have a joke someone told me that uh, someone came come he make aliyah from russia he's russian and they ask me ask him how you know t- please tell us how was in um, the life tell us the life in in uh, russia and 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 and, and he say no there is uh, was there is was perfect there is no nothing to complain 
say, what about the government? No, no, nothing. There is no, nothing to complain. What about the economy? Uh, there is no, uh, nothing to complain. What about the, everything? So uh, they ask him, so if in Russia, it's, there is no complaint and everything is good, why you, why you move to Israel? Why you decided to make Aliyah? And the answer, because here I can complain. Okay, because, <laughs> because here <laughs> I can't complain, but in Ethiopia, we met Mamesh, not, there is no complaint, shake it, silence, and they cover us with the blanket, and, uh, and they uh, begin to travel, like the movie, like the movie, Mamash, Mamash, is so I'm so excited to tell you now, Rabbi, because I remember uh, after a couple of hours, one woman, okay, we lost all, 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 all the silence, okay, and quietly, because one woman, she started to, uh, to weep and to cry and to scream. Ah! What happened? What happened? Shh, 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 check it, check it, check it, please, please, please. And now uh, the woman, she was pregnant. And Baruch Hashem, uh, how do you say in Yiddish? Kenai Nehore. And Kenai Nehore, Baruch Hashem, the baby coming at the night. On and, the truck? You know, Mazarto, on the truck, yeah. But the Mossad, they understood that the woman, she uh, going to uh, give birth. So they decided to stop all the truck and they travel in one corner between two um, mountains. And we go down, all the people go down. And the women gave birth, Baruch Hashem. And, uh, you know, so to be Mossad and to be like, um, how do you say, Mialedet in Hebrew. You know, a, a was, midwife, yeah. was amazing. <laughs> yeah, and I remember that there in this place, my first time, I drink no, not water. I drink juice. And I never drink juice before, never. When I drink the juice, I, I thought that I'm going to drink water. When I drink the water, and suddenly I test that the water is very sweet. And I asked myself, why the water were very sweet? Why? And suddenly I remember the story which my grandpa was uh, uh, telling us in, in, in our village in Ethiopia that the water in earth is like, like honey, it's very, very sweet. And I answer, wow, of course, we are very close to Jerusalem because this water from Jerusalem, I, I was very, very happy. And Baruch Hashem, the women gave birth. And now we request by the Mossad to go uh, back to the um, truck. And now in one truck, we were 151. Okay, because a baby again. And uh, anyway, they also cover us with the blanket and they continue to travel. And I remember suddenly the truck stop. We see at this moment nothing. And but we now hearing hearing a loud noise, a loud noise. And we have no idea what's this loud noise and we begin to pray. And you know, Fila, please, please, loud noise, what's this? And suddenly the Mossad, he opened the truck and we go down and I see something I never saw before. No plane, <laughs> no plane. I see water, a lot of water, water, a lot of water. This was the sea, Red Sea, Yam Suf. And I never, never saw the sea before, never. It was my first time, you know, to see the waves coming at you without realizing that they stop at the shore. And I saw that it's like Mabul, Mabul, Mamash Mabul. I was with my uh, uncle and I remember, I see, I see the sea and suddenly from the sea, 
people come out from the sea people come out like angel like malachim like malachim unbelievable and they were israeli commando of medinat israel it was amazing 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 you know to see the commando coming at you you know this is something i never see like this never never and they were how do you say in commando ayami this the commando ayami I remember that one soldier, he came to us and he suddenly embraced me and he kissed me. And I began to feel better, you know, more confident. Okay, as I mentioned, of course, they were Israeli soldiers, uh, how do you say, in a, a naval commando. You know, this was, was very, very exciting for me. And now, the soldiers put us in the what's called in robber boats and they brought us to the ship but we had no idea where we were you know suddenly from the dark to the light and all we knew was that we were in the vast hall full of light and music and 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 people applauding and showering us with scandings, you know. And I, I remember, and you know, when we saw this, suddenly we prostrated ourselves and kiss the deck of the ship. You know why? Because we believe in that we were in Jerusalem. And this was very, very exciting. Very, very exciting. And the soldiers, they don't believe they, why people kiss the deck. Why? But the secret was that we thought, you know, that we already uh, we are already in Jerusalem. You know, <laughs> I just want to tell you, Rabbi, that sometimes after we had arrived in Israel, we were invited to reunion for Olim and soldiers. It means Olim is a is new immigrant. Okay, and the commandos, the soldiers told us that they too began to cry when they first saw us in Sudan. You know, Rabbi, you can imagine that, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, naval commando, the commando Ayami, you know, the tough guy, you know, if you know the commando Ayami. The last person you'd, you would expect to be sentimental in the embracing a strange child and starting to weep. And I say, why? As I mentioned, George Friedman wrote, the history of Jewish people is accident of history. Therefore, of course not. But we were two brothers who were once of one flesh separated for 2,000 years of exile, who then embraced and reunited. So this is amazing. This experience is beyond human understanding and borders on the supernatural. So it's, it's amazing, amazing, amazing. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem is the Nes Gadol, and they took us to Egypt. Sharem Meshech, and we arrived to Sharem Meshech, and from Sharem Meshech by airplane, we arrived to Ben Gurion Airport. And I remember in Ben Gurion Airport, we saw the Ben Gurion is mean Jerusalem, okay? For Ethiopian Jews, all Earth Israel is Jerusalem. So <laughs> we arrived to Jerusalem in Ben Gurion. You know, until today, have some people when you used to ask them where do you live. Yes, they used to answer, I live in Jerusalem. Doesn't matter that, that they live in Afula or in Kriyat Gat. All Israel is Jerusalem. And I remember when we arrived to uh, Ben Gurion, some woman, she gave me a new name. Instead, uh, you know, my name, as I mentioned before, was Zode. And she wrote into Udat Zehut, Sharon. If there is any connection between Zode and Sharon, I used to say Gurnish with Gurnish. Yeah, Nasi. I don't know. <laughs> okay. First day Yiddish? 
Abyssal. Oh, so you are Jewish. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> I arrived to Abduction Center, Afula City. And from Afula City, I arrived to boarding school. And there I got a message, bed all my family, which I left behind me in Sudan, died. And they passed away. Oi. And for me, it was very, very, very hard. But I mentioned at the beginning, Rabbi, that we are descendants of Avram Avinu. And the first journey in Avram Avinu, God tell him, Lech lecha me'artzecha. And I used to say that lech lecha is mean lech lech. Go, go, keep going, and never stop. You know, this is the secret, one of the secret of Jewish people. Go, go, keep going, and never stop. And I never stop. But the boarding school in Afula, which is belong to Emuna women, they give me everything. You know, they carry about me, you know, money and shoes, food, everything throughout my home. And this is, you know, the, another secret of Jewish people in the world is solidarity. Solidarity is something very, very secret of Jewish people. And uh, anyway, I used to, to be an uh, orphan, and I told to myself that I'm going to spend my life, entire my life, by myself. And suddenly, two years later, the head, head of the, this house, Emuna House, he called me, and he told me, Sharon, immediately come to my office. And I, all, I went to his office, and he told me, listen, the message that you got two years ago was actually a mistake. And actually, your parents still alive. Wow. Yeah. So at this moment, you know, I say, Mechaya Ameitim. Baruch Hashem, Mechaya Ameitim. And the guy, he took me to the Ora Akiva. Ora Akiva is very, you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes from Afula. Ora Akiva. And I remember when I opened the door, the first face that I recognized was the face of my mom, which she passed away three years ago in Eretz Israel. So, you know, this is a history. And of course, I closed the journey, the first journey from Ethiopia to uh, uh, Jerusalem. But when, when I arrived to Jerusalem, the second journey beginning. And I, from my perspective, the journey in Israel, among Israeli society, is more, more difficult, more than the journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Why? Because this is, have, I used to say that, you know, have one, he dream, he dream, dream, and his dream, he saw that he arrived to the next world, the Olam Abba, and he arrived to a Gan Eden in the, in the paradise, and he saw a great of tzaddikim sitting around the table, and they were learning, learning Torah. And this guy became a bored, and he decided to go to Gehenom. And in Gehenom, he saw a lot of pub, hashish, girls, and the music. Oh, Metsuyan. And this was only a dream. And when he passed away, and he arrived in the same place and asked him, please, where do you want to go? To the paradise or to the Gehenom? And he imagined what he saw in the first time, he decided to go to the Gehenom and he got all the punishment that, which exists in the Gehenom and he asked, what's going on? Not what I saw in the, my first time. And, and they told him, the first time you were tourist and now you are Ole Hadash. <laughs> so, you know, the dream make to be reality. So it's not easy as someone, guy like with brown skin color, not black, it's brown, okay, as I mentioned. And someone, he's no, he, he don't know the, the language, okay, Hebrew language. And suddenly all the tradition is something else. Because the trad in Ethiopian, the tradition is something else, something is... This is based on, in, in, on the Bible, in the Bible. There's no Talmud, no uh, uh, Mishnah. 
because all the uh, Ethiopian Jews tradition came straight from the Bible. So this is a meeting between Ethiopian Jews and Israeli society. It's not only meeting between black and white and new immigrant and uh, and Olim uh, Hadashim and Vatikim. This is a, a meeting between two categories of Judaism, two uh, model of of, of Jewish uh, uh, of uh, 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 Jewish uh, tradition, so, so so everything was a challenge, and also also I'm not I'm not exaggerate. Also uh, all the you know electricity, everything was new. The electricity, the TV, the bathroom, you know everything was something new. I discovered chocolate. So I mean, my first time. Okay, I never eat chocolate before. Okay, but it was everything, and suddenly. Most of the very, very, you know, very hard. The rabbinet, they decided to send us to the mikveh, and you know, actually, because in Ethiopia, their tradition was when they marry, they used to write ktuba, but when they divorce, they don't used to write uh, get. They just take the ktuba and they turn up. Okay, the Katavla Sefer Kritut, Sefer Kritut, to change the Ktuba to be Sefer Kritut. And that's it. But according to Ethiopian Jews, go, oh, good. But according to Orthodox, if not uh, the woman, she's still married. So if the woman, she going to marry according to Ethiopian Minhagim, divorce, she's still married. So if Chas Khalila, if she going to marry, their children, they will be mamzerim, suffering mamzerim. So this was one of the halakha, why Mo'etzat Rabbanot Rashid sent Ethiopian Jews to the mikveh. But I myself, I go, I went to the mikveh, and uh, with the Hakazad Dambrit, okay? So I did everything. So I remember when I arrived to Yeshivat Haretzion, and I grew up and I arrived to Yeshivat Arutzion, Murid Rabbi, Arab Lichtenstein, and Arab Amital, one of the conditions to receive Ethiopian immigrant to the Yeshiva was if they already did the mikveh. So I did mikveh. So they, um, how do you say, receive me? Yes? No, no. Uh, I, yeah, they receive me accept, as a student. Accept you. Uh, oh, this is the word. Yeah, accept. They accept, sorry, they, they accept me by, uh, as a, as a, a yeshiva, yeshiva bucher. And I, first time, I asked my rabbi, Rabbi Amital, and I asked, why you, why do you uh, request from us to do a tvila? We are Jewish, one, what, 100%. And he told me, takshiv bachor, takshiv bachor, takshiv. Im yavo mishu machar babokem, po mi alon shvut, veyagid li, שבת שלי, אני רוצה שבת שלי תתחתן איתו. מה אני אגיד לו? אני אגיד לו, אתה ספק ממזר, אתה אולי, אולי לא יהודי, תעזור, תעזור. In other words, רבי עמיטל, he told me, listen, in ארץ ישראל, you don't need to be right, you need to be smart. You know, I disagree with this kind of, this message. You know when I understood? When I began in my date. My shiduch. And a lot of women, girls, which they non-Ethiopian, they told me, listen, my parents agree, there is no problem if you are Ethiopian, non-Ethiopian, but they ask me to ask you if you already convert yourself. You know, I used to say that when, before I go to meet my shiduch, I used to take the, uh, how do you say the, um, the certificate of the Tvila. <laughs> I met the girl say, oh, look, I am kosher 100%. There is no, you don't need to worry about me. I am kosher 100%. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, I, as I mentioned, I went to the army. In the army, I was officer, you know, to be officer after, uh, you know, 2000 years of exile in Eretz Israel. It is a high, high privilege. And after I, I have a dream, you know, I have a dream like, like Martin Luther King. Yeah? <laughs> I have a dream to be a rabbi in Israel. Uh, so I started 
my smicha in Harutzion. And my dream, you know, my, my, my purpose was to be a rabbi in order to be a bridge between Ethiopian community and between Orthodox community here, you know, to, in order to bring Ashkenazi people more and more close to the Ethiopian Jewish community. And simultaneously, to bring Ethiopian Jews more and more close to the Ashkenazi community, it was my purpose. So I started my, uh, my smicha in the Kolel, in Yeshivat Arutzion, and Baruch Hashem, I, know I finished, and I met Rabbi Lau, I remember, and I got uh, Yore Yore, and, and uh, Rav Shkuna. And, and Baruch Hashem, I also met my wife, and my wife, she make also Aliyah from uh, Switzerland, uh, from uh, Basel, and she's also a uh, Ole Hadash, Ole Hadasha. And uh, in our wedding was amazing, Baruch Hashem. We discussing how exactly to do uh, our wedding, according to Ethiopian halacha or according uh, Ashkenazi Yeke halacha. But uh, as I used to say, that if there is love, and we listen to each other. So if we were willing, we can find the solution for all the problem in the world. So Baruch Hashem, and we decided to do half, half. Okay, half Ethiopian and half Ashkenazi Yekes. Okay, so it was amazing. And now we, we uh, live in Kiryat Gat with five uh, kids, five children in Kiryat Gat. I remember when we arrived here to Kirat Gat, as I mentioned, I really want to be a rabbi in Ethiopian community. So when we arrived here to Kirat Gat, I arrived to the um, Kirat Gat institution, and the, the rabbi there was Haredi. He told me, listen, I can't give you the job to be a rabbi. And I asked him why. He told me, because you are not black enough. <laughs> I told him, what does it mean I'm not black enough? I am Ethiopian, look, look at me, at me. And he took his keeper. He told me, listen, I'm not mean to your skin color. I mean to your keeper, because <laughs> your keeper not black. I was in shock because how you can, uh, you know, I took this keeper, my keeper, say, this is Shmates. If I will be this shmatis, so even I don't want to be a, a rabbi under your uh, responsibility. So I decided to leave everything and go to the university. So I began my university second degree, and I finished my PhD in Jewish philosophy in Bar Ilan University. And during this period of time, I got now suggestion to be a rabbi by the Tsohar organization to be rabbi in Ashkenazi community, you know, to see this congregation. As I mentioned, it's not, it's not me. It's this, this is Am Israel. This is Am Israel story. Because to see one in one hand, people, Ashkenazi people, which they came from Holocaust survivor, and the rabbi is, uh, he came from Ethiopia. And they, both of them, they pray and they embracing each other under one umbrella. And this is America. This is the next Gadol Me'ot Shalom Israel. Sharon, in just starting to wrap up, what is the state of Ethiopian Jewry in Israel today? I know there were some well-publicized protests this past summer about inequality and, and challenges there. Where do you see the situation today? Listen, people say that, you know, I, I remember a couple of um, articleists uh, from uh, South Africa, okay? They came to see the phenomenal uh, community in Kiryat Gat, okay? Kedoshe Israel, which they are. And they know that Israeli the very racist, racist against Arab people and against Ethiopian people, okay? And they believe that Israeli society, there is racism, okay? Racism against Ethiopian and, and the people say, 9% here, they say that Israeli society 
is racist against Arab and against Ethiopian Jews, okay? And there is now today, unfortunately, Ethiopian Jews, they are 2% among Israeli population, but between 20 and 30%, they are in the, in, in the jail. So uh, our uh, conclusion is, of course, in Israeli, there is a racism against Ethiopian Jews, okay? But Rabbi, I want to tell you, I want to ask you, I remember when I arrived here, I was a small child, brown child, never test Jews before. Even I don't know how to use the bathroom. I don't know what is electricity, okay? I know even how to open the tap water. And now I hear today in Eretz Israel, I finished my PhD. I, I am rabbi in Ashkenazi community. So how I claim that Israeli society is racism. So it is more complicated to, to you know, I don't like the conversation, dichotomy conversation. I am, unfortunately, I want to tell you, Rabbi, that the conversation in the world, even in America, even here, is more and more tend to be dichotomy conversation. Who is support and who is against, black and white. There's no, you know, a complicated perspective. Of course, Israeli here, you know, I prefer to recognize what's going on here is not racism. This is preconception. This is stereotype. It's not racism. And one Ethiopian, he told me that I asked the Ethiopian, I should and I need to improve Israeli, which I am very clever. But Ashkenazi, he need to improve to his people which he is stupid. So the preconception of if you Ashkenazi, your name is uh, Feinstein, okay? So probably you are very clever, but if you're from Ethiopia, eh, you are very stupid. So there is, you know, I am rabbi, okay? Now I'm, I'm also in, in university, but no one, he think that I'm a rabbi or also I'm a, I'm professor in university. Okay, this is because when you, you know, 90%, when you see Ethiopian, in your mind, it's oh, Ethiopian, they just uh, come from Ethiopia, from a village, they never uh, uh, study in university. So uh, this is the problem. So it's not Odek, not uh, rights, but we need to work very, very hard. If I don't blame Israeli society as racism, I, all the time, I, I never take responsibility to myself. Because if I say Israeli society, they are racist, I blame all the time Israeli society. I blame all the time the government. I never take responsibility to my life. So I prefer to recognize this situation as a preconception, as a stereotype, more than the uh, racism. But a lot of my friends, they don't agree with me. They dis disagree with me. And they say, no, 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 Israeli is a racist. But I prefer to say, no, Israeli is not racist. Israeli is um, with high uh, stereotype and uh, preconception. You know, I just, I want to tell you, you know, a lot of people, even in my synagogue, even in my synagogue, he told me, listen, I, I accept you, my rabbi, because you convert yourself. You convert yourself. But I don't believe you historically, which you are, you are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even in my community, okay? And I met here in Rabbi, one Haredi, one Hasid Gur, Gur Hasidi. You know, I, I told him, oh, Shulam Aleichem, Shulam Aleichem Yid, Shulam Aleichem Yid. He was in shock. And he told me, oh, my goodness. Uh, it's mean oy veizmir, oy veizmir, ashvarte ret Yiddish. And his friend, he know me, he told him, listen, omnam, he is ashvarte, 
but he is with a vice and a shume. A vice and a shume is mean a vice and a shume. Okay, so, okay, a vice and a shume is, you know, is, is, maybe it's racism, not racism. I don't care. I don't care. Okay? If someone uh, scream against me, yeah, black, black, so I don't care because I know who I am. I know who I am. I am 100% Jewish. I'm proud. So I don't care if someone call me, you are ugly. You are, uh, I don't know, you're black. So why I need to uh, be very angry? If I'm angry, so may, I may, maybe I, I, I agree with him, okay? But I want to tell you, you know, to close our uh, conversation with something very be- beautiful, you know, and this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, re- represents the uh, modern solidarity and, uh, you know, the, the, in Jewish people today, that one day, I think uh, three years ago, maybe four years ago, I, I got a call cell phone, and in the cell phone, he was uh, someone, his uh, name is Danny. He was a, so, um, a commando in Sudan in 1982, a Mossad commando. And he told me, listen, Sharon, you, you don't remember me, but I help you to come to Israel from Sudan to Eretz Israel. I was your commando, and now I request from you to be my commando, my mifaked, to be my rabbi, because I'm going to um, uh, marry my son, and I want you to be my rabbi, and I want to close the circle with you. And I want to tell you that under the chupa and all the uh, which he, uh, they participate in this chupa, all of them cry, because I mentioned the uh, the the story how we started from Sudan and now we are studying under Hupa and I actually this is Jewish history you know open and close open and close all the time and Baruch Hashem Baruch Hashem I think this is it's amazing amazing Baruch Hashem incredible story I could cry just listening to it really beautiful. Rabbi Dr. Sharon Shalom, thank you so much for joining just, us today. Rabbi, I just want to uh, finish. Yeah. That Baruch Hashem, just well, uh, one year ago, we were privileged to establish the International Center for Study of Ethiopian, of Ethiopian Jews at Ono Academic College. And this is amazing, amazing, you know, established again, the first international center for study of Ethiopian Jews in academic world. And we continue. I'm very optim- optimistic, very, very optimistic. Go, go, keep going and never stop. Call out Baleva Pnima, Nefesh Yudi Omiya, Olavda Tikvaten. Rabbi Dr. Sharon Shalom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi Ari. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting patreon.com that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash jews you should know finally if you have enjoyed this podcast please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to jews you should know